when cast out of God's sight, we are nothing but condemned. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Hembry. I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery, a program designed to take you through the world's most important book, the Bible. And we want to encourage you that in three minutes, we're going to talk about Jeremiah 15, the weeping prophet. He is really on it. And we're going to focus on these 10 verses. So stay there in three minutes. In 17 minutes, Ryan and Corey are coming. Corey? I'm taking a look at even more signet seal discoveries that relate to the prophet Jeremiah. Ryan? Does God's anger last only for a moment or does it last forever? This is a question that I'm going to be attempting to answer today on the program. All right, look forward to that. All right, now, Janice is coming up in about 20 minutes. Janice, what are you doing? Today I'm talking about come in today. All right, get your Bible guide and turn to this passage. If you don't have one, stay there. We'll tell you how you can get one. Let's focus on God. Jeremiah 15, 1 through 10. Then the Lord said to me, Even if Moses and Samuel stood before me, my mind would not be favorable toward this people. Cast them out of my sight and let them go forth. And it shall be, if they say to you, Where should we go? Then you shall tell them, Thus says the Lord, Such as are for death to death and such as are for the sword to the sword, and such as are for the famine to the famine, and such as are for the captivity to the captivity. And I will appoint over them four forms of destruction, says the Lord, the sword to slay, the dogs to drag, the birds of the heavens and the beasts of the earth to devour and destroy. I will hand them over to trouble, to all kingdoms of the earth, because of Manasseh, the son of Hezekiah, king of Judah, for what he did in Jerusalem. For who will have pity on you, O Jerusalem? Or who will bemoan you? Or who will turn aside to ask how you are doing? You have forsaken me, says the Lord. You have gone backward. Therefore, I will stretch out my hand against you and destroy you. I am weary of relenting. And I will winnow them with a winnowing fan in the gates of the land. I will bereave them of children. I will destroy my people since they do not return from their ways. Their widows will be increased to me more than the sand of the seas. I will bring against them against the mother of the young men, a plunderer at noonday. I will cause anguish and terror to fall on them suddenly. She languishes who has borne seven. She has breathed her last. Her son has gone down while it was yet day. She has been ashamed and confounded. And the remnant of them I will deliver to the sword before their enemies, says the Lord. Woe is me, my mother, that you have borne me, a man of strife and a man of contention to the whole earth. I have neither lent for interest, nor have men lent to me for interest. Every one of them curses me. Jeremiah chapter 15, verses 1 through 10. You know, when you say judgment, a lot of people get really upset. Judgment, what do you mean judgment? I mean, thou shalt not judge, right? Well, no, that's not what the Bible says. But anyway, we need to remember that we don't need to become judges, but nevertheless, we have to understand that God does judge because he's perfect. And in many ways, Jeremiah, he was a broken man. He was called to deliver a message that was neither pleasant nor constructive. When a message is given to bring correction, those who hear the message have the opportunity to change their ways. Jeremiah's message to the people was God's word to a stubbornly rebellious Jerusalem. And it was one of the sure and coming judgments against Judah and her cities. When we hear the weeping prophet proclaim such a directive, it is chilling when we consider 
what really would happen and what that meant to the people who heard it. For many of them, the message carried a fatal judgment. There is a completeness to these prophecies that remind us of God's overall plan for humanity. We need to listen and hear the Lord. We need to pay attention to the word and to the scripture, beloved, because as we do this and we learn and we understand, we, we realize God is, is talking. And that's important. Look, as, as we read the 15th chapter today, this is really important. There are 10 verses here. We need to understand the context of the scripture in which this is set. A rebellious people God's talking to. And I want to say that there are people today who are rebellious and there are some who are not. And uh, God is God. It, I mean, you, we can argue day and night and have philosophy from PhD and 3HD and 4HD and 5HD. It doesn't matter. But God is God, regardless of what you think. So it becomes important for us to hear this. So if you take your Bible guide, if you don't have one, call us or write to us and we'll send you one. Or go to Bible Discovery TV and click on it. It takes you to a donate page. Thank you for your donation. And uh, you can download it right from there, just exactly how we printed it, and you can join us. But let's focus on this and let's pray. Father, I pray today that your word would come alive. As we read it, we would hear what it says, because this is important. I pray, Father, that we would not put our mind into it, but we would take from it your correction by the power of your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, and we said together, amen. Look at verse 1. Verse 1. This is stunning. We'll, we'll put it on the screen for you. Then the Lord said to me, even if Moses and Samuel stood before me, remember that, even if Moses and Samuel stood before me, my mind would not be favorable to this people. Cast them out of my sight and let them go forth. And it shall be, if they say to you, where should we go? Then you shall tell them, thus says the Lord, such as are for death, to death, and such as are for the sword, to the sword, and such as are for famine, to the famine, and such as are for the captivity, to the captivity. And I will appoint over them four forms of destruction, says the Lord, the sword to slay, the dogs to drag, the birds of heaven, and the beasts of the earth to devour and destroy. I will hand them over to trouble, all, all kingdoms of the earth, because of Manasseh, the son of Hezekiah, the king of Judah, for what he did in Jerusalem. Jeremiah says that. You see, when we cast out God, when we cast out of God's sight, we are condemned. When cast out of God's sight, we're history. Thankfully, on this side of the cross, God's merciful through Jesus Christ is explained and given to us. We need to understand that, beloved, as we focus on this. We need to understand that God is, I mean, this, the Lord, it's serious. It's not just a thing over here. This is the main thing. It's serious. Look at verse five. For who will have pity on you, O Jerusalem? Or who will bemoan you? Or who will turn aside to ask how you are doing? You have forsaken me, says the Lord. You've gone backwards. Therefore, I will stretch out my hand against you and I will destroy you. I am weary of relenting. And I will winnow them with a winnowing fan from the gate or in the gates of the land. And I will beheave them of children. And I will destroy my people since they do not return from their ways. Then widows will increase to me more than the sands of the sea. I will bring against them and against the mother of the young men, a plunder at noonday, and I will cause anguish and terror to fail or fall on them suddenly. And she languishes who has borne seven, and she has breathed her last. Her son has gone down while it is while it was yet day. And she has been ashamed and confounded and relent, and the relent of them 
I will deliver to the sword before their enemies, says the Lord. Now look at this. God will destroy those who are against him. Let me get this straight. God will destroy those who are against him. Now is the time to come to the Lord Jesus, beloved. Come to Jesus Christ today, right now, at this second. Say, Lord, forgive me of my sin. I believe you are Lord. You came, died on the cross, rose again in the flesh. I need you. Amen and amen. Very important. Now look at the last verse. Watch this. It says, Woe is me, my mother, that you have borne me, a man of strife and a man of contention to the whole earth. Have neither lent for interest. I have neither lent for interest, nor have I men, nor have men lent me, lent to me for interest. Every one of them curses me. Here we go. Jeremiah complains to the Lord about his status on the earth. <laughs> Beloved, listen, we should always be honest in our confessions to God. His Holy Spirit will help us. Always be honest. I, I have to tell you, I don't know what it's like to be Jeremiah. Suddenly you're given this message and you got to give this message to Jerusalem. I mean, that's, it's no wonder he's called the weeping prophet. I mean, I get it. I mean, who wouldn't weep if you're, you look at his work and you go, oh Lord. And Barak has some interesting things to say around chapter 48 and 46 and all the rest of it. But let's remember that if we are honest, it's like the gentleman who said to Jesus, Lord, I believe Forgive my unbelief. That is so great. Jesus turned and he said, I have not seen such great faith in Israel as this man. See, beloved, when we're honest with God, he truly helps us. Because if we're not honest and we build up ourselves, it's no good. There's nothing we can do to serve God. Our service to God comes when the Holy Spirit infests our life and, and brings us the truth and the grace of Jesus Christ in him. That's important. So let's remember that. Come to Jesus Christ and learn his ways and know his paths. In Jesus' name. Hi there, Bible Discovery TV is available to you 24 seven. If you have Roku, you can download our app and you can watch all of our programs at your own convenience. We're also available on Amazon Fire. So just search Bible Discovery TV and you'll be able to find us. Did you know that Bible Discovery TV is available on your phone? You can watch the program whenever and wherever is most convenient for you. On iPhone or Android, search for Bible Discovery TV in the App Store. Today we're continuing our journey through the book of Jeremiah, and we read a lot in the prophets about God's frustration and anger towards those who refuse to repent and turn to him, despite God's many, many warnings to do so. And this brings up a related issue, specifically regarding the length of God's anger, because some skeptics have claimed that the Bible contradicts itself on this particular issue, since passages like Psalm 30 verse 5 Jeremiah 3 verse 12 and Micah 7 verse 18 all seem to indicate that God's anger is very brief. And on the other hand, passages like Numbers chapter 32 verse 13, Jeremiah 17 verse 4, Malachi 1 verse 4, and Matthew 25 verses 41 and 46 seem to claim that God's anger lasts a long time and even for eternity in some cases. So is God's anger brief or does it last forever? Well, let's dig into this apparent contradiction a little bit more so we can see what's really going on. The Word of God has been under attack since the beginning of time. In the garden when tempting Eve, the father of lies questions God's words. Did God really say? Since then, this sown seed of skepticism has grown and flourished for thousands of years producing the rotten fruit of lies and disbelief. As a result, today we live in an age of record doubt and skepticism towards the scriptures. So skeptical, in fact, that even a skeptic's annotated Bible has been published. However, the lies and errors lie not within God's word, but with the skeptic. For example, critics proclaim that there is a massive contradiction in the Bible regarding God's anger. 
They cynically ask, how long does God's anger last? Psalms 35, Jeremiah 312, and Micah 718 all indicate that God's anger is very brief. Whereas Numbers 3213, Jeremiah 174, Malachi 1:4, and Matthew 25 verses 41 and 46 all indicate that God's anger is long or even eternal. There are, however, at least two problems with this allegation. First, the critic here has committed the logical fallacy of bifurcation. That is, they have created a false dilemma or an either-or situation. This occurs when a person asserts that there are only two exclusive options, when in fact there is a third possibility. Second, they have also failed to consult the original language of these passages. This is very important, since there are several different types of anger, wrath, indignation, and displeasure. These are often indicated by the specific Hebrew or Greek word used in the context, and can denote very significant distinctions. The critic here rolls all these together as if they were one. Also, the Bible teaches that God's anger toward the unrepentant is quite different from his anger toward believers. For the redeemed, God's anger is brief, but for the unrepentant, God's anger lasts long or even forever. As far as the two verses in Matthew 25 are concerned, these are referring to punishment with no explicit mention of anger or wrath. In fact, Matthew 25, 46, one of the very verses in question, explains clearly that the difference depends on whether the person is positionally righteous or wicked. So the critic's error here is really inexcusable. The Bible is, always has been, and forever will be what it claims to be the Word of God. So as you can see, there's no problem with the biblical text at all. The problem lies with the critic who's erred on at least three points. First, he's committed the logical fallacy known as bifurcation, which is when a false dilemma is created. In other words, they create an either-or situation. Second, the critic didn't check the original Hebrew and Greek languages, because if he had, he would have soon realized that there are different types of anger, like wrath, indignation, and displeasure. And third, one of the very verses the critic is questioning, which is Matthew 25, 46, clearly explains that the difference with God's anger depends on whether the person is positionally righteous or wicked. And this reality should create a healthy fear in us to turn and trust on Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, the only one who can make us righteous in the eyes of the Father. It's really interesting, you know, when you begin to look at the words, uh, people have problems with the Bible, but a lot of times it's in the words. And the words, you know, there's several translations of the word fear. Yeah. And the fear of God is not like the fear being afraid. It's like a, a respect. Yeah. And uh, so people misunderstand the Bible when they don't understand the words. Thank you, Ryan. Mm -hmm. Very good. Corey? All right. Well, in yesterday's segment, I discussed the discovered signet seal impressions of several Jerusalem officials whom the Bible sa says served during the reign of King Zedekiah, the last king of Jerusalem. And today I want to take a look at several more signet seals and impressions from this time period and even a bit earlier of men that undoubtedly would have known the prophet Jeremiah. So the first two have to do with the high priest Hilkiah, who served during the reign of the godly king Josiah when Jeremiah was a young man. So the first seal impression was found in an official excavation in 1982, and it says belonging to Azariah, son of Hilkiah. And the second is a physical seal, so not just the impression, made of a blue stone that was bought on the antiquities market in 1980. And it says belonging to Hanan, son of Hilkiah, the priest. Now, by looking at the carving and styles of these seals, researchers believe that they may have been carved by the same craftsmen. And of course, they date to the same time, so during the lifetime of the prophet Jeremiah. Hilkiah the priest was the one who discovered the book of the law that continued to inspire King Josiah's faithfulness to God. And according to Ezra 7, Ezra the scribe was a direct descendant of Hilkiah and his son, Azariah. Now, there has also been an official of King Josiah whose bullet impression was discovered in 2019 in the Gavadi parking lot excavations in Jerusalem. And it reads, belonging to Nathan Melek, servant of the king. Now, Nathan Melek is mentioned in 2 Kings 23 verse 11 as having a chamber in the temple complex. Now, for the prophet Jeremiah's later life, 
Two clay impressions of the same seal were found on the antiquities market in the 1970s, and they both read, belonging to Berechiah, son of Neriah, the scribe. Now, Berechiah is the long form of the name Barak or Baruch, who is named as Jeremiah's scribe all throughout his biblical book. Now, originally, the authenticity of these bullae were questioned, especially because they weren't found in an official excavation. But after an extensive evaluation in 2016, they have been seemingly cleared as authentic by experts. Now, another bulla that was found on the antiquities market in 1982 may represent a challenging figure from Jeremiah's life. It reads, belonging to Hananiah, the son of Azariah. Azariah is the long form of the name Azar or Azur, meaning that this could be Hananiah, son of Azur, the rival prophet to Jeremiah. In Jeremiah 28, this prophet takes the yoke off Jeremiah's neck and breaks it, giving an opposing prophecy to Jeremiah's, solidifying himself as an enemy of God. Now, an interesting detail about this seal was that the writing was completely encircled by carved pomegranate. So it was a bit of a flashy style, a statement piece to be sure. Finally, we have two bullae from men who were responsible for getting Jeremiah thrown into a Jerusalem cistern in Jeremiah 38. Jehuchel, son of Shelemiah, whose seal impression was found in 2005 excavations, and Gedaliah, the son of Pasher, whose seal impression was found in 2007 excavations. These men were nearly responsible for Jeremiah's death, but thankfully he was eventually rescued from the muddy cistern. So in total, we've looked at the seals and seal impressions of seven more men who, for better or for worse, would have known the prophet Jeremiah. You know, th this is fascinating stuff. And uh, yeah, I call him Barak, but mm -hmm. uh, that, that's when I first heard about this uh, back in, I think it was 2003. Mm -hmm. And of course it was all, you know, well, it's not really until 2016. But this is fascinating stuff. Thank you, Corey. Yeah, you're welcome. Excellent stuff. Amazing. Okay, so we have more stuff coming tomorrow? More stuff coming up. There's all kinds of things happening. So and that's the good. question comes up tomorrow. Oh, the question. Yeah. Make sure you tune in tomorrow <laughs> for the Bible IQ question. It'll be a good one. Right. Which I won't respond to, but they'll have to respond to. Okay, go ahead, Jim. All right, we talked about come in today uh, in my segment, and I... This, th these whole chapters of Jeremiah, my heart just goes out to this man because he is, he is witnessing the breakdown and the punishment of God's people around him after being warned and warned and warned. And this chapter is called, The Lord Will Not Relent. And there's a portion here, the Lord says, for I am with you to save you and deliver you, says the Lord. And I thought, how amazing is it that our God sent his son to die for us, to take the punishment uh, that we deserve. And, and he gives us his grace and his forgiveness when we accept this gift of salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. It, it really is the good news. It really brings us salvation. Jesus has taken our punishment for us. When we choose to follow Christ, it's a decision to walk with him forever. And that's the difference. When you come to God, he knows your heart. And so when you truly come to God in honesty and you say to him, you know, I've heard this message of the gospel and I believe, I believe Jesus, that you are the son of God, you are Lord, that you died on the cross for my sins to pay the cost of that and that you rose again in the flesh three days later to give me the gift of eternal life would you come into my heart today and would you turn my life around and help me to follow you i promise to follow you all the days of my life when you mean that and you say that with your mouth and you mean it in your heart god saves you and you are filled with God's Holy Spirit, and you begin a new walk, you become a new creation. It's like the light all of a sudden goes on, and the purpose for which you were created becomes alive in you. And it's, it's very special, and it's wonderful. 
but it's a decision that we make in our hearts to, to turn away from the way we walked before and to follow after Jesus. There was a little song I haven't been singing for a while because I've been struggling, struggling truthfully with some respiratory things. I'm better now, getting better. But do you remember the little Sunday school song? And I've even heard Pastor John singing it every now and again. Pastor John Williamson. Yeah. Uh -huh. and, and it goes like this. Into my heart, into my heart, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Come in today, come in to stay, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. And if you pray that, and if you mean that, and you have the heart like a little child to come humbly before God, He will hear you, and He will come into your heart. And uh, we need Him. I know I need Him every minute, every second of every day. I just want to thank you for supporting us and being a part of this ministry as we read the Word of God. That's important to know the Word of God today. I want to pray for you as well. Father, I pray in Jesus' name for everybody who's given and just help them. Help them to know, Lord, that they've given to a ministry that loves your Word. We're going to teach your Word. And so, Father, as they support us, we'll continue. So thank you, Lord, and help them, Lord, in this time to make all of their needs subject to your perfect will. In Jesus' name, amen.